Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are tuning in in the world. Um, welcome to the World Jewish Congress webinar. I'm Eve Stieglitz. I'm a member, I'm a U.S. member of the World Jewish Congress Jewish Diplomatic Corps. I'm here with Lieutenant Commander Ayel Dror, who's the founder and commander of the Good Neighbor Unit in Israel. So glad to be with you here this morning in New York City. How are you? Great, thank you for inviting me here. This, this is, it's a this pleasure. Is, I know, this is a really special <coughs> opportunity. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Ayal Dror is actually married with three children. He lives in Kibbutz Dei Nechamia, which is located in the nor northern Israel in the upper Almost the, near the Lebanon border. Is that in the Golan? Uh, no, which is next to the Golan. Okay, so. wow, so you're up there. I think it's very, like, the Baha'i, the, the, the different um, gardens are there, like there's a lot of waterfalls. And the the Baha'i is in Haifa, so it's okay. one hour and 30 minutes from there. It's two kilometers from the Lebanonian border and 30 minutes from Golan High. So it's the, almost the northern place in Israel. Very north in Israel. So, um, so we're sitting here today and um, Lieutenant Colonel Ayal actually served as an officer in the Israeli Defense Forces for the past 24 years in a variety of positions in the front line and as coordination and liaison officer in the coordination of the government activities um, in the territories. And about three years ago, he founded and served as the commander of the Good Neighbor Unit, the Israeli aid to Syrian civilians in the Syria-Israeli um, border area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the Operation Good, Unit, Good Neighbor Unit um, was? Yeah, of course. So as everybody know, in 2011, it was the beginning of the Syrian war. Mm -hmm. Now, just on the Israeli-Syrian border, we saw approximately 250,000 citizens, Syrian citizens, educate centuries to hate the state of Israel. And we decided that we cannot stand uh, and not do nothing when we saw their miserable lives because of the war. So in 2013, the first uh, Syrian uh, wounded evacuated to Israel. Their lives has been saved. And after three years uh, that we saved the life of 3,500 Syrian wounded, the State of Israel decided, after the request of the Syrian side, to increase the humanitarian aid uh, to the Syrian side, and I had uh, the honor to establish a unit, a unit that her mission w was 24-7 thinking about Syrian side, how to help them, how to send them whatever we can and whatever they need in order to help their basic lives. Who, who um, came up with this original idea? I know obviously you st it kind of went into execution in 2016, but you were saying it, the planning stages were back in 2013. So who came up with the original idea, and then how did you get recruited for this specific role? It was a, a military thinking a while Syrian, seven Syrian people approached the fans. For them to come to the Israeli fans, it was a very brave move to come to the enemy state yeah. and to ask for the help. When the military, uh, the Israel military understand that there are people living there in terrible circumstances because of the civil war, we decided as an army, of course, everybody that had to get the approval, gave the, the approvals, but the military uh, continued to do this for three years. And then the military decided to establish the Good Neighbor Unit. Uh, I served in the Kogat, uh, and I was the chosen one to uh, came to the Golan Heights and to establish this magnificent unit. Um, who, who did you have to coordinate with on the other side, right? Because they can't, I mean, you have to engage with them and you don't have relationships. There aren't currently Israelis living in Syria, from my knowledge. So the first people that we connect with was Syrian doctors, Sy Syrian medical teams, because the relationship of evacuating uh, people and then other operations in the health section, and we will be able to speak a little bit uh, about them. Yeah. And from those uh, health uh, teams, it became to people who were responsible on their families and their villages who connect us and ask for more help, not just on the health a section also for food and diesel and other stuff that we can supply. So, so clearly there were people in Syria who were willing to engage with Israelis. Yeah. Right. You know, it's just that they had they couldn't do it on their own. Yeah. 
In Arabic, there is a sentence which means uh, you are living because you are not, you are not dying. Mm. They were living in very hard conditions mm. and they took the risk, it was a risk, to speak with the Israelis uh, and from that point we just moved forward and we didn't stop until the uh, operation finished. Before 2013, when this initially started, I mean, what was the communication like between Syria and Israel? I mean, I think we were discussing this earlier um, when we were chatting. Jews left Syria in what, like the, the 40s? In the, the, the early 40s or 50s, mm -hmm. there was communities of Jews living in Syria, but they all uh, left. And basically, there wasn't any connection, or there wasn't any connection between Israel and Syria. And there was, of course, uh, some uh, opportunity to speak on through the UN, but there wasn't any uh, connection at all, one-to-one uh, -one speaking. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing in this project that in the first time uh, we succeed to speak with a lot of Syrians and approximately 250,000 Syrian people living just next to the, our border had the ability to learn who are the Jews and who are the Israelis. It was the first time so I think. This, this is a generation for the most part would you say never spoke to a Jew before but maybe their grandparents have like Ma ma maybe, of? although in this area mm -hmm. Jews weren't living. So mm -hmm. the people living in the Kinetra region, in Dara region, I think even their grandparents uh, didn't meet uh, Jews. They just educated to hate the Jews. This is wow. what was uh, playing in their minds. To hate the Jews, Israel is the enemy. And from that point, it was the, the rising of knowing each other and yes. you know after they met us in these six years I think I'm sure not think I'm sure that now they are thinking something else about Israel and the Jews uh, and I think this is one of the most biggest achievements of this project absolutely I mean to go back for those who are not as familiar with the history in the region can you maybe help explain to our audience why Jews had to leave Syria begin with? Uh, because of the, the regime. The regime that rise in uh, Syria in the 60s did not uh, like the state of Israel. I think that most of the audience know that it was the 67 war and the 73 war. So uh, there wasn't any warm relationships between Israel and Syria. Uh, and after 40 years of silence, because although there isn't any agreements between Israel and Syria, uh, this was our quiet border since the end of the Yom Kippur War mm -hmm. till 2011. Uh, it was a quiet border and then with the rising of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Iranian militia and Hezbollah resigning on this area, we had to figure out what we are doing, how we are going to secure uh, the Israeli-Syrian border. And one of the tools was this amazing project to let the civilians know us and understand that we are with them, we are not against them. Right. Um, if you're just tuning in, um, I'm Eve Stieglitz. I'm here with Lieutenant Colonel Eyal Dror, um, founder and head of the um, Operation Good Neighbor on the Israel-Syrian border. Um, and just want to continue the conversation from where we just left off a moment ago. Um, can you kind of go into more of the initial coordination um, and that what it looked like when the civilians came through the um, Israeli border? So our first operation, and I think it's the most exciting thing that uh, we have done in this yeah. project, and I think that even in, in my life, was a doctor visit operation. We call it doctor's visit. Until that point, we evacuated wounded uh, Syrian people, but from 2016, we decided to increase the humanitarian aid Doctor visit means we took every week 25 children wow. and it is in the age of your children or your little brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and we took them to Israel hospitals. They were suffering from chronic diseases, uh, diabetes or problems in the eye or in the ears. And they never treated? It's, no, it's something that oh. in our and world... And they didn't even know they had diabetes perhaps? No. Oh. This is something that in our world it's yeah. basic uh, treatment. However, in Syria nobody will... Uh, I, I will not say nobody care, but nobody had the ability to treat mm -hmm. in those days. So we took 25 children. Now, 
I want that the, the audience will try to close their eyes and to imagine what does it mean to go to the fence in the evening. It's late at night, at 3.30 uh, after midnight. It's cold because in the Golan Heights we're freezing in the winter time. It's right. cold, it's rainy. You cannot see almost nothing. You can hear the heads of the explosions from the war inside. And you're becoming and you are coming to face the unknown and then you see the 25 children. 25 children are coming with their mummies. We let them cross the wow. Israeli border and ta take the, taking them to the Israeli hospitals. Now, as a military officer, the mission was to take them from point A to B, from the border to the hospital, as a human being. And it was such an amazing uh, role that we took part in this operation. We had the opportunity to play with them, to let them uh, play ball, to let them draw uh, on the paper, uh, to let them eat chocolates and candies, to bring a medical clown that will make them yeah. laugh a little bit. And right. It's so In their hard. own language. Yeah, in their mm -hmm. own language. It's so hard to say Syrian children are not crying. As a father, yeah. it's shocking. You're seeing a Syrian boy running, fell down, is not crying. And we had the privilege to let them smile, to let them some 10 hours, 12 hours of peace, of not thinking as I'm going to, am I going to die today? Mm. And I think that this was the most impressive thing in this operation. 1,400 Syrian children entered Israel in 72 operations in the close visit operation and so Israel. It's mean 3,000 Syrian people, children and their mothers. So Israel is of all kind of Israel, Jews, Christians, Druze, Arab Israel, yeah. they met Israelis and came to the border again, to their villages, and sh spread the rumor. They were our civilian ambassadors. They spread the rumor that Israel is not the enemy. That's, inc that's incredible, Hasbara. I mean, was there one specific hospital you used? We uh, took them for three hospitals, the Ziv Hospital in Safa, the, the Galil, uh, Upper Galil in Haria, and Tiberia Hospital, Paria Tiberia Hospital. So it basically with those three hospitals, when there was some operation, specific operation, for example, we made seven injuries of heart uh, injuries for uh, uh, babies. It was in hospitals in Jerusalem, in uh, Tel Aviv, yeah. So it was a little bit complicated operation, but basically most of those uh, kids came to the three hospitals in the north of Israel. Were they integrated with the other patients in the hospital at all, or kind of kept? Um, no, we, we took them uh, as a separate in order not to make mm -hmm. For them, uh, a little bit risky. It was, uh, let's say, something. Uh, in the beginning, it was a secret operation, so we didn't yeah. know that we didn't want that it will be published, because we take care for their security when they will come back to Syria. Uh, and the procedure was amazing with the hospital. The collaboration with the hospital was amazing. So this is one of the operation. Um, and after we understand that this is a successful operation, mm -hmm. and the trust has been built step by step. My second mission after building this uh, uh, trust was to find founders. Now, I'm an IDF soldier. Yeah. I cannot make an evening and speak with the world, give me money. It's not my duty. But what we found is NGOs, non-governmental organizations, working in the humanitarian world, not Jewish. Some of them were Israeli, some of them were Christians, mm -hmm. and some of them was even Muslim organization, and we hugged them all. And I think it was the first time in, maybe in history, that Jews and Christians and Muslims working all together under, let's say, the, the, under the IDF commander. It's amazing, it's something very strange, yeah. but it was like this. And one of the uh, Christian organizations, the Friendship Unlimited, for example, they built, they were working 30 years in the humanitarian aid. But they were, this was their first mission in combat zone. And they opened a day clinic care just behind the fence between Israel and Syria and the DMZ and tried to figure out what does it mean for 8,000 Syrian people that raised to hate the state of America and raised to hate Christians and Jews and Israel huh. entering this clinic and finally they find some Amer American people, 
smiling, hugging them, giving them a hot chaka, a popcorn, and then a doctor examined their children, their parents, and they are coming back to Syria. 8,000 Syrians who visited in this camp, Ishai clinic. Or it was another collaboration with the Frontier Alliance International Organization, also an American organization with the amazing Delton Thomas. And they've sent 16 people from the States and in, uh, from other con and under countries, their medical teams, and they were living one year in the villages in Syria and help those uh, citizens. So are you, it was are amazing. you able to, to communicate with them once they're back in Syria? Is there an open dialogue at all and you can check up on see how yeah, they're doing? Yeah, it, it was, it was. That's it was, the, we had the opportunity to communicate with them, to speak with them, uh, to get from them the okay that they are uh, alive and everything is cool with them and the population is hugging them and it was amazing, yeah. I've traveled near the border before on several trips and I always see these uh, United Nations ambassadors and trucks. Are we, how involved was the United Nations with this uh, It project? wasn't. It, it wasn't, wasn't at all? It wasn't at all. That's a shame. You say it. <laughs> we think moving forward, they see like this is a successful operation. Maybe we should um, work with Israel. Uh, unfortunately, on unfortunately, uh, nobody from the big organizations, that family, and I will not say the names, but yeah, nobody from the big organizations that working all over the world in humanitarian help, and we've tried and we spoke with some of them. Nobody helped. What we found is organization. Let's say it's not small because what they brought, it was a major contribution to this yeah. project. But of course, if someone, if, if the UN or other organization would yeah. be involved, it will be better for the Syrian people. It wasn't for us. It was for them, for the Syrian people. Well, I hope they see this interview or learn this story because I know United Nations has the resources there. It would it would really be great um, to invest in this type of resource work. So I'll just put that out there. You never know, it can help. <laughs> Let me say it, because that's what we're doing, right? We're spreading this important yeah. um, um, story that, that's gonna be continuing. Now I have to mention this from a safety aspect, because living in Israel, security is one of the top priorities. Of course. Um, every day, right? And um, obviously, when you're letting in all these Syrian civilians, there's a risk, you're, Israel's becoming vulnerable. You have Hezbollah there, you have ISIS, I mean, you can mention some other, other groups. Al-Qaeda. Terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda. Which Al is very familiar wow. to the Americans in the yeah. Suriname, Jabhat al-Nusra, there was the Iranian militias. Let's say in this area, all yeah. our best friends came and sat on this border. Wow. And we chose, yes. we chose to risk our lives 700 times, huh. 700 humanitarian operations through the israeli syrian border and we chose to do this uh, for those uh, civilian syrian civilians mm -hmm. every time we went to the fence it was you know it wasn't like uh, walking at central park it was to open a fence to an enemy state everyone is looking it wasn't a secret operation you cannot do a secret operation when you are moving two trucks and forklift to the fence you know the noise i think in aleppo has been heard of this uh, Operation. So it's not mm -hmm. uh, a secret operation, but uh, we chose to risk our life in order to help those people. And we took the understanding that every night can be the last night. So as you can mention, we were moving as an IDF uh, soldiers as we have been drilled to do, but it was no bullets, it was hugging, it was so amazing. So no terrorist breaches of all those? No, no. Thousands no. upon thousands of people. Yeah, today I, t today I can say thanks God. But yes. we, pr we pray every day, every night, every wow. night that nothing will happen to our soldiers and uh, thanks God it nothing happened. If you received any teenagers, I'm thinking of that age, and they're obviously, it seems like they're being fed propaganda and being brainwashed in their education system if they have any. Um, did they talk to you about programs where they're being radicalized or mm -hmm. recruited to those terrorist groups? No, what they've all mentioned is they've been raised to hate the state of Israel. And now when you ask them why, why? Yes. you are not familiar with us. Yes. 
the answer of all of these mothers and all of these children was uh -huh. they told us look to the west this is the state of israel this is an enemy state mm -hmm. one day they will come and they will kill you and they will conquer your land and wow. i'm proud to say that today yeah they are not waving the wave of israel in the Kenetra region of course yeah. but deep in their hearts they know that we are not the, the enemy now one of my unique moments was when one of the mothers of the Syrian uh, children that entered in the doctor's visit. Now, yes. she's a mother 20, 30, 35 years old, means that 27 years she educated the state of Israel, and she wrote a letter. She wrote a letter to the state of Israel. I published it, and she's saying, thank you, Israel. So you can understand that this woman, from me, is what we achieved. Syrian women that educate hate us and now understand that we are not what we have been told about. Wow. Um, can you share some other kind of, I guess, personal stories that you've come back with? Yeah, um, so. The experience? First of all, one of my most traumatic uh, uh, events was while I was sitting with a 10 year old boy. I'm a father of three wonderful children. Mm -hmm. The biggest girl is eight, just eight. And you know, I'm asking her as a father, mm -hmm. what do you want to be when you be an adult? And as a eight years old girl, she's changing her mind every month. Last, uh, last time she wa wanted to be a dancer. And I sat with the Syrian boy and I asked him, you know, while we were speaking, what do you want to be when you be an adult? And he was just staring at me and I asked him again. And Believe me, my Arabic was a little bit better than my English, so I knew that he <laughs> understand me. Oh, okay. And just in the third time, he responds, Sir, I won't be an adult. And to hear it as a human being from 10 years old boy, yeah. it's shocking. I asked him why. And he st told me his story that some of his classmates has been bombed, in one, has been died in one of the bombing. So he is thinking that this is, will be his future. He's used to seeing his friends yeah, dying. be murdered. Yeah. That's the norm. So, so yeah. What so an it's, awful it's way traumatic. To grow up. However, something mm -hmm. for me was one of my most amazing moments was when we saved a nine years, old, nine years old girl. She came to the border with very hard diabetic. Now, I'm not a doctor, but in my crew, I had, we had the doctor and when we uh, took her to the hospital, so the doctors, the Israeli doctors explained that if she just came 24 hours later, she wouldn't have survived. Now, before she left uh, to, to Syria, she was hospitalized in Ziv Hospital for six months. It was amazing treatment uh, uh, by uh, the personnel of this uh, hospital. And when she, uh, just a few days before she left, I came to, to visit her. And she drew for me the flag of Israel. She wrote my Arabic name, Abu Yaqub, and her name and it was the flag of Israel. And it was amazing. It was amazing because six years ago, nobody if it was sitting here or anywhere in the world, a person will say that another, it, it will happen that a Syrian child would draw the flag of Israel. Nobody could have been, will have believed it. And it happened. It was amazing moments. So there was hundreds of emotional moments, something that we care, me and my soldiers and all the people that work in this project. I, I saw share. that picture um, and hopefully maybe World Jewish Congress can post it either in the comment section or later today and some other pictures that you shared from that because it's, it just gets you in the heart. It's, it's like, wow, this is, this is a, this is a, a big um, impact here. Um, the operation, I guess, officially ended in yeah. 2018. I assume there's follow-up operations by a different name, perhaps, mm. or okay. So, so it the can't good be just ended, right? The good, unfortunately, yes. Really, the, the Good Neighboring Project came to an end in the summer of 2018, while the Assad regime conquered again this right. area, and now he's responsible for this area. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot help any more those Syrian people because the regime is refusing uh, from their uh, decisions and their agendas. But uh, what was amazing in this last two months of this operation that yeah. 
while it was bombing, the regime bombing these areas, we found on the Israeli Syrian border almost 50,000 people. They weren't running in order to enter Israel. Mm -hmm. They were running just to hide from the uh, bombing of the regime. Now, imagine yourself, 50,000 people standing on a field without homes, without clothes, without nothing. They ran away for their lives, and now they're standing 700 meters from the Israeli border. The Good Neighbor Project took a decision that we will help to those people, uh, in addition to the, all the other help that entered inside. And in the last six weeks of the project, we sent hundreds of tents, because it was June, July, it's the hottest uh, months in, in, the, in the year, especially in the Golan Heights, it's 35 degrees, it's very hot there, so we send them, first of all, uh, those uh, uh, tents, and after that uh, we send them food and uh, medicine and diapers and uh, baby powder milk, everything yes. and other uh, food uh, that they can eat without cooking because they were living in the field. So it was for almost six uh, weeks that we support them. And the last operation, and I think that some of the audience have heard it, uh, it was the rescue of the White Helmets people. The White Helmets uh, were Syrian people that helped their own people uh, when there was bombing and other things, of their saved life. Mm -hmm. And just before we uh, finished the project, it Who, was- Who's usually part of the White Helmets? Like Syrian are they people. Christians or they Muslims? No, no, no. They are Muslims. They are Syrian, yeah. Syrian residents living in Syria, all over Syria. They are yeah. sponsored by other countries <coughs> and trained to save lives. Now, we were, uh, the Good Neighboring Project wasn't in any connection with them. However, it was uh, asking from uh, the high ranks in the government to save them. The Syrian-Jordanian border was conquered by the regime, so the only way to save them was yeah. through the state of Israel. And it was amazing uh, operation of the Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the uh, Foreign Affairs Brigade of the Army. Uh, Ten hours of operation in the end of July. My role was to communicate with the manager. So in the first time I spoke with a white helmet person and I guide him to the border. Now, it wasn't this man coming by, hims by his himself. It was more than 400 people from the White Helmets with their families. So it was men, women, babies, children, their whole running it was to see there, to, to stand there in the middle of the night and to see the people standing in their homeland in Syria, gripping of fear, frightening to death. Yes. And they entered the state of Israel, which was their enemy, which was compared to devil. Oh, wow. And smiling and understanding that their life has been saved. It was amazing moments. And then, then we took them to Jordan. It's really them. through dialogue that you can end these lies and propaganda. Yeah. I mean, would you say, so you're telling me how the Syrians are taught to feel about Israelis and the Israel Defense Forces, the army. Do they feel the same way about Jews as a whole, or are they all the same? in their minds? As I mentioned, when they were, for example, in the hospitals, they made all kinds of Israel, not just the uniforms uh, of the IDF. Yes. They made all kinds of the Israeli society. We had Druze doctors, we had Muslims, brother and nurses, we had Christian people, and we had the Jews, the Israelis. So they mentioned and they became familiar with all kinds of Israel society and it was the first time for my, in my life that an Arabic uh, woman is hugging me and saying thanks to me. So I think that they were very, more, very much appreciated the help that uh, we gave them. Um, again, if you're just tuning in, we're having a fascinating discussion. I'm Eve Stieglitz, a member of the World Jewish Congress JD Corp, sitting with Lieutenant Colonel Eliel Dror, who was the um, founder and commander of the Operation Good Neighbor on the Israel-Syrian border. Um, in terms of back when the civilians are back in Syria, so to speak, after being under your care and Israeli care, um, what do you think they're coming back with? I mean, 
Are, you think they're sharing maybe a, what we call as like Hasbara about their experiences in Israel? Um, how are they doing? Um, what, also, what's their bright future? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel for them, for these people? So I will try to uh, answer it on two sure. different uh, levels. So first of all, when they came back, I'm sure that they, they spoke about Israel. Why? I'm sure because the operation, doctor's visit, continued 70 times. And even if in the winter times, when it was heavy rain, they refused to cancel it. I spoke with them, I told them the atmosphere is not good for little children. Those children coming without shoes, those oh. ch children coming without jackets, they're freezing and they refuse to cancel it. So I'm sure that it has been spoken good things about the state of Israel. And I will try to emphasize it. In the first days of the project, while we tra transfer, for example, baby powder milk, there was rumor that they putting it in yellow bags because they do not want it will be written in Hebrew. Now, after almost two years, I asked my colleagues and I was a little bit laughing. I told him, I've heard that you are putting our rice in uh, yellow bags. And he started laughing, he told me, my friend, we, we don't have enough bags for 30 tons of food. So they were, weren't shy when the project increased, they weren't shy to get Israel assistance. So I'm sure that they have been uh, shared the rumor and we saw it because 700, 700 operations, it means that in the other side there were always people that were lovely to get our assistance. Now, what is the, their future? My personal point of view, I don't see for them a glory future, not because they got help from the state of Israel, because mm -hmm. as much as I heard their lives are not didn't become better in the last seven uh, months that the regime came back to this area, but this is what, just what I'm thinking about. Of course, I don't have any connections with the people on the other side, but as you can read, and the Syrian civil war didn't end, and you yeah. can read it and you can Google it, they are not living in good uh, conditions in all over Syria. So why the residents of the Kenetra region, which was a poor residents before the civil war will be now richer and happier. It seems like there's just no nation pride in Syria. Like they, they've lost that, right? I mean, and their identity. And as so many people also have left and fled. So is there, is there hope? I don't know. They can become <laughs> more free country? You think it's, it's all about no, the I Assad think, regime? Or? Uh, I think that there is much complicated questions than uh, I can answer, but yes. w what I can and what I know yes. to say is the Syrian civil war, I think it didn't end yet. And there is a whole region of the Ilib region that living there are citizens. I'm not speaking about mm -hmm. the bombing. I'm not speaking about Al-Qaeda. I'm speaking about human beings. And I know that in Italy we are living approximately 3 million citizens and while the regime, if the regime will attack them, who is suffering is the civilians, the citizens. So I cannot see in the next year's glory future for Syria. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully as a human being, it's not connected to Israelis, it's, not, it's just a, a human being that loves the, the world and want to live safe and quiet in the world, so hopefully I'm wrong. So you're just recently retired after 24 years 20, yeah, 20. Um, of service in the Israeli Defense Forces. So what are you working on now and what's next for you? So I must say to the audience, and I'm not now coming to do the PR to the IDF, but it was the most amazing achievements in my life to serve my country uh, for 24 years. It was a huge privilege. Uh, now I decided to quit because 24 years is enough and I want to have some time with my wife, my children, my family, you know, when you are officers in those uh, areas, in those positions, you don't have weekends, you don't have hol holiday, you don't have birthday time, uh, because when the army is calling, you have to go. Uh, this is the only thing that there isn't any negotiation between my, wa my wife and I. Uh, she knew that the army is always on first place. So now, first of all, we are having a little bit time for ourselves. Right. Uh, but what I swear to myself to continue doing is to share my story. Um, 
I think that there is, there is too little heard this uh, amazing story. It was uh, too little published, uh, first of all from security reason, and then because I don't think that this is the most interesting uh, 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 story for uh, media channels. But for people, for human beings, I think that this is a wonderful story to hear. And for Israelis and people who support Israel, and even for the people who do not support Israel, to become familiar, not about just what we are hearing in news, in daily news about Israel, yes. to see the other side of Israel, to see that Israel helped uh, and risked their own lives in order to help those Syrians. So this is my mission, this is my mission in life, and I will continue uh, speak and tell my story here in the States, in Israel, wherever people will be glad to hear it, I'd be a pleasure to come and speak with them. I mean, this this specific even humanitarian story and really a story about diplomacy, right? Kind of a, a new age diplomacy, so to speak, where you then you were initially embracing the enemy and then through dialogue you're realizing you have so much more in common. We're all just people and humans and we have to get past propaganda and brainwashing and lies in the education system. It's just through having dialogue and, and helping each other yeah, so just as humans. This is such a topic I just think so many, um, so many are now are passionate about and would love to know about because this is not a story I think at this moment that enough people know about. And I love I'm to sure. make it widespread. Um, if you could share this video, if you could share more information about um, Lieutenant Colonel Yal Dror, that'd be really helpful. Um, I think you mentioned you're open to, to speaking in different um, communities yeah, of course. around the U.S. as well. This is what uh, I'm doing. This is what mm -hmm. I've uh, done since the day I left uh, the Army. And it was amazing. <coughs> you speak about diplomacy. So I'm not a diplomat, diplomat uh, person, but I spoke uh, two weeks ago in, the, in our Memorial Day. And as an officer, to speak in a Memorial Day, it's something very, it makes you very proud. And I spoke with a, a group from Australia, Jews from uh, Australia. And this is in Israel? or In Israel. Yes. I spoke with them in Israel. Mm -hmm. And one of the audience asked me, uh, so how you can bring peace to the world? So I answered that if I had the answer, I probably was a prime minister or something like this. But what I became familiar with is when people know each other, mm -hmm. people know each other, they realize that no, nothing is like you can see in uh, videos or in uh, media. So this is my mission, to meet people and to tell them the story and to let them understand who are Israel in, uh, in other ways and truly, who is the truly the Israelis. Well, I hope everyone in the audience, and we included, can, um, can help you share that story because this is so important and timely. So I want to thank you again. This was thank really you very much. Was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.